In a huge castle, there lived a king and a queen. The king and queen really wanted a baby. They couldn't have one, but eventually they did. They were so happy. It was a beautiful baby girl. She was the princess. They loved the princess. They. Threw a party so everybody could see her. It was a big party. They invited three magical fairies. The three fairies brought the princess wonderful gifts. The first fairy gave the princess beauty. The second gave the Fair, the princess, a wonderful singing voice. The third gave the princess intelligence. There was a big problem. The, they forgot to invite one weary old fairy. The fairy was not happy about not being invited. The evil fairy gave her a present, the present of a curse. When she is 16, she will prick her finger on a spindle and fall into a death-like sleep. The king and queen were upset by the curse. They had all spindles removed from the kingdom, or so they thought. One, one day, the 16-year-old princess was wandering the, the castle when she came across an old woman. The princess pricked her finger on the spindle and fell into a deep, dead sleep. What could we do? Everyone in the castle was also in a deep sleep for, for a hundred years. The only thing that could break the curse was a true love's kiss. For a long time, the 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 castle sat quiet with everyone asleep. People forgot about it. One day, a prince heard the legends and went there to search for the princess. He saw her sleeping. He fell in love and and kissed her. The curse was broken. They lived happily ever after. Time to get 
dressed. Ready for my big performance. What is the dog's favorite part of a body? Bones! What's a dog's favorite part of a house? The roof. Get it? Roof? Roof? And last, what's a dog's favorite button on the remote control? The pause button. Get it? Because dogs have paws. In the rolling hills beside Seneca Lake in the town of Ova, New York, stands a 475-acre compound that was once the home to tens of thousands of patients from 1869 to 1995. This is the Willard Asylum for the Chronically Insane. These buildings are living time capsules of the history of mental health treatment in America and the way we look at our mentally ill. The view is undoubtedly a beautiful scene, horrors that took place behind these walls were nothing short of terrifying. Willard opened its doors to its first patient in 1869. The institution grew quickly, sometimes welcoming several hundred patients a week. By 1877, Willard was deemed the largest mental institution in all of the United States. When the first patients arrived at Willard, they were stripped of every item they brought with them. Mental illness wasn't the only reason a patient was admitted. Poverty, birth defects, criminal behavior, religion, homosexuality, homelessness, and epilepsy can all be reason for admittance. Once a patient is admitted, it is highly likely that they will spend the rest of their life there. There is little to no information about mental illness in this era, so doctors experimented with many types of treatments. Several forms of therapy were attempted at Willard, and very few were successful. Early on, patients were treated with ice baths, whippings, and physical restraints. Later, occupational, musical, hydro, and physiotherapy were introduced, along with more invasive practices such as lobotomies, insulin-induced comas, and electroshock therapy. Several patients died as a result of these therapies, and many committed suicide. In the year 1942, the institution provided 1,443 treatments of electroshock therapy. Into the 1900s, tranquilizers and antidepressants were introduced and widely used by the staff. Willard was very self-sufficient in its prime. The institution had its very own morgue, hospital, water supply, recycling warehouse, and fire station. Willard's existence depended on free labor by the patients. It wasn't all work, though. The patients did have access to forms of entertainment. Built in 1892, Hadley Hall was home to a theater, a bowling alley, and a snack bar. Patients and staff eagerly looked forward to every Friday night in Hadley Hall, where they gathered to watch a show in the theater. The compound is made up of several Victorian-styled buildings that each serve a different purpose. Some buildings are still in use, and some are in complete ruins. The buildings that are falling apart are surrounded by a tall fence labeled with a red X. Located a few miles west of the main buildings is the Willard Cemetery. The cemetery consists of a field overlooking the lake covered in waist-high grass that extends for 30 acres. This field was the final resting place of 5,776 deceased patients. The only patients who were given gravestones were the 38 who served in the Civil War, 
the other 5,746 patients were buried in the field, separated by six religions. New Protestant, Old Protestant, New Catholic, Old Catholic, Jewish, and Old Jewish. There were no headstones, but a few patients were lucky to get a small circle plaque with a number on it. In 1995, the Willard Asylum for the Chronically Insane closed its doors due to a push for deinstitutionalization. The entire institution was completely abandoned, with all belongings, files, bedrooms, and offices still intact. A few years after Willard closed, Workers discovered hundreds of untouched suitcases that were taken from the patients when they arrived and are now part of a traveling exhibit that has gained national attention. Some of the buildings have been repurposed and are now used as a drug treatment facility for convicts, a camp, a bank, and is also home to a daycare. Even with these new programs, some of the original buildings haven't been touched in decades. These buildings tell us stories of struggle, stories of growth, and stories of tragedy. Most importantly, these buildings show us how far the mental health industry in America has truly come.
I've always had to fend for myself, cook and feed, but something about it just helps you grow up. Every summer I work construction for the county, but I have to use my money sparingly. I finished high school, but I was obviously too broke for college. I could live my life with a 9 to 5 job, but I just want something more. I want to be a rapper. You know, like Biggie and Tupac. The famous guys. I don't really know what I'm doing, but I have to do it all myself. YouTube helps, but it's not exactly a One of the hardest things about rapping is actually rapping. Rhyming is hard, lyrics are hard, pretty much everything is hard. A lot of times, I just don't know what to say. <sighs> finally uploaded a song last week. Got a few views. Looking at the comments is a good way to get feedback. You suck. Quit YouTube. What are you even doing out here? Um, let's put that away for now. Sometimes I think, why am I even doing this? Am I just hurting myself in the process? I guess dreams are called dreams for a reason. I woke up inspired. Like usually you'll say, mom, five more minutes, but I didn't want to fall back asleep. I wanted to make music. I started just randomly recording myself freestyling and I was doing good. The words were coming out of my mouth without me even thinking of them. There was never a dull moment in the song I made last night. And out loud I said, this song, this song is gonna be the one to make it. I was scared and nervous to post the song. It had been almost a whole day and I just still couldn't upload it. I had even made a name for the song already, back in the day. It was corny, but it made Finally, sense. I said, you know what? Screw it. I titled the video and clicked post. I was thinking about the song ever since I posted it. I haven't checked up on it yet, 